appreciate the invitation to come in here this morning and give you an update on on-farm research trials, specifically on-farm research trials that have been funded uh, by AFREC. AFREC, as you know, is a fertilizer tonnage tax that growers pay on every ton of fertilizer that's sold in Minnesota. And that exclusively is what has funded this research project. So my appreciation to all Minnesota growers for um, helping to fund this program. So I, I'm an agronomist, I uh, have a consulting business, I'm based out of the cities, but I have been an agronomist since the late 1990s and uh, started my career with Cargill Fertilizer, then Mosaic, and then in 2014 started my own consulting business. Uh, I've been passionate about nitrogen and, and precision ag my entire career. Uh, I started my fertility research in around the 2000 timeframe down in central Illinois, working with University of Illinois first. And then uh, also have been working with the University of Minnesota. So most of my on-farm trials are not done completely without uh, guidance or insight from the university. So I'm hoping today to show you some scientific-based approaches to doing on-farm research and maybe challenge you on what you think you can do on your farms, uh, whether you're in Minnesota or beyond. So as I look back on my career since the late 1990s, the value of data is steadily increasing. The technology gets better year after year. And now we're seeing the government and commercial businesses all starting to take a real serious interest in data. You know, government is looking at programs to set up and enforce BMPs around nitrogen. Commercial businesses are selling new products and services every year. And they're looking to farmers to help validate those programs work by doing on-farm trials and really growers too have an interest in improving their efficiency because growing crops in Minnesota, let's face it, corn and soybeans are commodity crops. We're trying to grow the maximum amount of crop for the least amount of cost. And on-farm research trials can help farmers manipulate or, or improve that quality, or excuse me, that efficiency. And of course, they are starting to get more and more concerned about the looming regulations, about when they can apply nitrogen, where they can apply it, and how they can apply it. So this is a, a slide from about 10 years ago. I saw this, I believe it was at the short course, and I've kept it in my slide deck in rotation uh, the entire time because it's a great insight into who's making decisions at the farm gate level. And I highlighted the top two on this list. It's crop consultant and fertilizer dealer. And this was a survey of almost 300 farmers from around the state funded by Minnesota corn growers and the University of Minnesota. And it really provides you the insight as to who has access to the growers, who is the one that is helping the grower make that fertilizer decision, seed decision, crop protection decision. And unfortunately or fortunately, depending on who you are, it comes above the university extension. This is their data, their survey. And so really we have access as consultants to those growers to do these kinds of studies. So the hope is that any program that gets designed, developed, built with on-farm trials in the future is done in conjunction with these two groups because these are the keys to unlocking on-farm research. And I think our friends in the, in my experience, this was my personal observation, is that this is what I think our friends who are developing carbon programs are still trying to determine yet, is they haven't quite figured out the value to those of us who are consultants and dealers, the middlemen, the people that work with the farmers, a lot of the programs I see still jump over that and go directly to farm programs. And so I think there's a learning curve yet with the industry and in trying to figure out how to, to get any program into the hands of the farmer. So today I'm gonna to work to answer three questions. Uh, we're gonna see if Minnesota farmers can conduct high quality replicated nitrogen trials. I've got some data to support that. You can make your own decision at the end. Number two is what are the opportunities and challenges that we have? in developing, maintaining, growing, supporting this kind of a program. And is number three, is the grower's current nitrogen program maximizing their ROI, AKA does MRTN work, the maximum return to nitrogen program work. So what is an on-farm trial? An on-farm trial is, a, is an experiment that's done on a field that you own or you rent or you have control over. Generally, it's not going to be on the research farm it's not going to be a field that has been in research for a long time. It's going to be something that you do a trial and then you move on to another field. So you may not know everything about that field. Uh, that may make 
some people uncomfortable, but in the world that we live, this is how business is done. We're going to do trials and then we're going to move on. And so that's the first thing. That's how I'm defining it. Second thing is that we're going to be using precision ag data layers from machines that are doing the fertilizer applications, remote sensing, and from yield monitors. And this is a little different. If you look in the literature the last 20 or 30 years, a lot of extension publications talk about measuring wheels and flags and marking off you know, certain distances and then weighing grain. But we have the technology today with the precision ag mature where it is to do that with corn and soybeans specifically that maybe we can't do with other crops, but we're fortunate to do those kinds of things with technology. And then of course, trying to use replications in the design and statistics to give us some confidence in the results so that we don't just look at two bushels of yield difference and say, yeah, that's something that I'm willing to invest in. We need to make sure that we have the statistical power because beyond the farm, we're also trying to influence people in the industry and regulators and people who are ultimately going to be helping us succeed in the future. So what I'm gonna talk about here, I've got some data. I wanna share two years of data. I'm gonna share the 2018 AFREC on-farm trial data and I'm gonna share the 2020 data with you. We don't have enough time to share the 2019 data. So I wanna give you a couple of looks at what we did. In 2018, AFREC funded 48 on-farm trials, eight of those being timing uh, trials, 40 of those being rate studies. And we'll look at the 40 rate studies as part of the presentation today. It was coordinated through retailers, consultants, seed dealers. 55 people were involved in this project beyond just myself. We looked at three nitrogen rates, replicated those three times for a total of nine plots in every field. That would be the MRTN rate plus 30 pounds of nitrogen, minus 30 pounds of nitrogen. Focused on corn and nitrogen, really not looking at other crops at this time, although it would work with any other particular crop that you, or any nutrient for that matter, PK, sulfur. We can't do this for free. So we have a set amount of money that we divide up among the farmer and his advisor to pay for potential yield loss, to pay for their time, and technically to lease that part of the field because we're gonna ask for that data back. And we recognize that in this day and age, the data isn't free anymore, boys and girls. We need to pay farmers for that data. And so this budget is to pay for that data where maybe in other programs around the state, things that are done at retailer level, things that are done between a consultant and his, and his grower, you know, those data points probably won't find their way back into public databases. That's what we're paying for is to get data into a public data pool and that's why that investment is made. Farmers were asked to plant single hybrids at a single rate, manage everything else about these trials uniformly, but I didn't babysit them, right? I didn't account for every possible little nuance in the data. We just don't have that time with on-farm trials to ask for everything because it's just too much work. We have to trust. So we use that establishment of trust between the advisor and his grower to say, hey, did you use a single hybrid? Yes or no? Did you plant it? at a single rate, yes or no, but we don't record that in, in, in a lot of the parts of this, of this trial. And so the other thing we did is one protocol across the whole state. That way we have a statewide database. And that's really one of the things we're trying to develop here. So if you look at this uh, chart on the screen, this was the MRT and calculator from Iowa State. That's where that, that particular program is housed. I think Dan and Fabian feed that every year with updated trials that they have. But this was in 2018, we had a 10 to one nitrogen to corn ratio, it was 350 corn and 35 cent nitrogen. Those days are long gone, but, or at least for now. But the range of nitrogen rates that were acceptable were 117 to 145 pounds of nitrogen. And most of these trials were in that 140 pound MRTN rate, right? A lot of growers that were in this study were in that rate. So they were in the top end of that range, but they were still operating within the MRTN. So moving on here, how do we do on-farm research? It's a six step process here and I'll go through these and then I'll, have, I'll dig into a couple of them particularly in subsequent slides, but we're trying to find a field boundary. We gotta have a uh, shape file to start with to pick out the right kind of field. We're going to create a prescription map. The applicator is gonna go spread that fertilizer and we're gonna get that as applied map back. We have to know where that fertilizer was spread. It's no longer good enough to just say, yeah, I did it right. 
we, we, I know from looking at hundreds of as applied maps that it seldom is done right. And it's not necessarily the fault of anybody. It's just equipment failures, not incorrect settings on the equipment. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong in the field. We live in the real world. So we need to have that as applied map in order to have confidence that the rate I asked for was the rate that we actually got. I do a scorecard where I look at the target rate, which is the rate I asked for and the rate that I got. And I create a, a, a map showing how good was the machine at doing that. The next thing is to take in-season imagery. In this kind of a program, I don't have the ability to go scout every one of these trials. I'm not cutting lanes to walk up and down rows. We have to do this from UAVs, from airplanes, from satellites to look at other things that might be impacting the trial besides nitrogen rates. We're gonna get the yield data back, we're gonna do some cleaning processes, and then we're gonna create some data out of it. So just to dig in for a second about this as applied thing that I talked about being a concern, there's, uh, you know, there's ideal as applied data. And this is when the machine is, is going at a slow speed and it's been calibrated by the grower or the retailer and they're able to achieve the rate that I asked for. What you see here on the screen is as we go from one rate to the next, there's a little bit of a lag time as that machine either steps up the nitrogen rate to match the new rate or comes down. And that's generally 30 to 50 feet. It's good to know that because I usually trim that out. I usually cut out the yield data at those edges because I can't have as much confidence in those areas along the edges of the trial. Uh, but there's also cases in when I have a much more difficult time. So light green is where I want to be. That's plus and minus 5% of the target rate. That means the machine hit the rate that I wanted. Darker colors towards the blue means I overapplied. I'm heavy by as much as 15 to 20%. And if I'm brown, I'm light by 15 or 20%. This scorecard is what I show to everybody who did one of these after trials to give them some kind of feedback because they may not know this. At the end of the field, the tank is empty. Uh, they think that's success. That may not be success if you're trying to do an on-farm trial. So you need to have a look back at your applicator and make sure that you're achieving the rates that you want to, because if you're not, you're setting yourself up for garbage data that may not be able to prove you as a grower are able to increase your nitrogen rates or decrease them, for example. So here, I think the application didn't have the right look ahead and it wasn't able to hold or achieve the target rate. It's an easy fine tuning uh, sequence that a grower can go into the, the, the controller and change the look ahead and maybe the responsiveness of a butterfly valve or how fast that machine responds to change. This is in season imagery, uh, two different fields from the 2018 season. The picture on the left shows a, a tile inlet that I had designed a trial and I didn't realize there was an inlet there. So this is letting me know that in that plot that I'm gonna to have to deal with some issues because there's probably either going to be standing water or soggy areas of that field and the combine was going in every direction to try and pick up and scoop up that corn because it wasn't planted in a row. So I may have to cut out part of that plot. And it's nice to know that in advance so that I have a scientific reason or basis by which to cut out some of that trial or at least some of that plot. And on the right-hand side, that's soil variability. This is, I think, an eroded knoll versus a lower, heavier area. And I can see, to, I can expect that there's going to be those, those non-treatment effects, that spatial variability. Even though I tried to make my trial compact by having my blocks 600 feet long and 100 feet wide, I still am going to deal, have to deal with that monster of spatial variability here. And that's going to show up in the statistics. Some yield cleaning processes that I have done over the years is to make sure that I, I, I pull back from the edges by removing the partial swaths, places where there's a cleanup row where the combine has an odd number, it's not a full swath. There's no reason to include those. A lot of times I don't think the yield monitors are, are calibrated to run partial, at, at partial widths. So I try to use only full swath widths. Uh, I do some outlier analysis using statistics. This is done in GIS where it's easy to, on the basis of statistics, throw out, but generally, you know what? Those aren't very many points, maybe a few dozen because the machine stopped suddenly or started suddenly when you get that 700 bushel spike. But in the grander scheme of an average over several hundred yield data points, I don't think this is you know something that we need to be all that worried about in my experience. And then 
buffering inside the plot, right? This is where if the machine that did the fertilizer spreading doesn't match the, the multiple of the width of the combine, then part of that combine could potentially run across into one of the other nitrogen rates. And so what I do is I make sure that I buffer the inside of these plots and eliminate that possibility. So I do that through a process that I have of, uh, of looking at the as applied data and I internally uh, buffer the, the trial. That has worked very well to reduce the variability. And I, I look at that through statistics such as the coefficient of variation and some other uh, you know, standard deviation and some other variability that I see in the yield data. But all this being done in GIS, this is what I get out. I'm starting to move from maps to tables of data. And this is a, a result for one trial. Plot IDs on the left-hand side, 101 represents the first rate, uh, 105 pounds. There were 317 yield data points in that block. So usually an observation every second. So you can kind of say that's 317 seconds worth of yield data in that particular trial. It ranged from about 80 bushels to 243 bushels per acre with an average of 200. It was just over an acre in size. Uh, that we, ha we harvested 213 bushels in that particular trial and the median yield is 202. Sometimes I like to use the median because again, with the outliers, the median helps me deal with really low and really high um, yield values. So that's just another tool in the toolbox that you can use. But now we're getting into the part that people who don't farm understand the statistics. They're wanting to ask us, okay, did this work? Does it work? And with three reps, three rates, nine plots, we can do ANOVA, which is a statistical process that we can start to look at. Do we think there's reason that the uh, yields that we achieved with this trial are based on statistics significant or not? And so this is a, an example of one of the trials where it shows the, the farmer rate was 202 bushels per acre. Sorry, the farmer yield was 202 bushels per acre. If we dropped off 30 pounds of nitrogen, we achieved 189 bushels per acre. If we added 30 pounds to the farmer rate, we got 216 bushels. So with the statistics at the 0.1 level, we needed to have 12 bushels of difference between those yield differences for it to be statistically significant. And we got that. So in this particular trial, I'm fairly confident uh, as an on-farm researcher that there's something to this, that there probably is a reason to think that this trial did respond to nitrogen. Whether the numbers indicate that or not, we have the statistics now to start backing that up. And this is all done through R or SAS or your favorite statistical software package. If you don't know how to use these programs, there's people now on the internet who will do this uh, at, at a fair cost, right? So I've, I've looked at finding um, people who are statistic, statistical experts who can help me with this service, but I've also used people from extension service at, uh, at, at both Minnesota and uh, universities around the Midwest who've helped me uh, shape that program. So across all the 40 trials, now let's take a look at the, what we saw in 2018. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you're seeing uh, a couple of the trials that we started in actually the fall of 17. So fall of 17, we did the farmer rate and we did minus 30 pounds. We didn't do the plus 30 pounds in fall because I hadn't decided that that was what I wanted to do. I, I wasn't sure that I wanted to show data that uh, actually encouraged farmers maybe to apply a higher rate. So I was a little concerned, but I got the courage in spring of 2018 to go ahead and add that treatment in. So that's why you see that those bars uh, there's a gap in that. So the average yield for our farmers who applied fall nitrogen was 176 bushels to the acre if they backed off 30 pounds of nitrogen, 185 bushels to the acre if they applied the MRTN rate. So that's close to 10 bushels in, in 30 pounds of N. So farmers definitely don't want to back off based on this single year of data, don't want to back off any more than the MRTN rate but if we fast forward that to spring, we see some more interesting observations. 209 bushels was what the average was for all the, the, the 40 sites, uh, sorry, for the spring sites, which I believe is 29. If we backed off 30 pounds of nitrogen, that went down to about 204 bushels per acre. If we added 30 pounds, we picked up another 
three bushels an acre, roughly 212 bushels in the acre. So that's the spread we were looking at. There was a, a difference there. And I want to show you in the next couple of slides where I think that's uh, something a farmer should consider or not. So this is a piano chart that shows uh, the distribution of those yields that were achieved when we look at the, uh, um, we look at additional 30 pounds. So added 30 pounds of nitrogen, what happened? So on average, we increased the, the yields by about 3.2. I believe that's, um, that's what we, we want to convey here is that the other thing that, that's important to note is that in 2018, nitrogen price was 35 cents a pound, uh, 30, 35 cents a pound in nit uh, fertilizer of uh, grain prices were $3.50 a bushel. So that 0.1 ratio made 30 pounds of N equal to about 10 bushels, $10 to the acre, which would buy you about three bushels of corn. So this was kind of a break even um, process for growers. So 29 trials, and you can see the corn on corn trials being the blue sites, but those were definitely more responsive than, than, uh, than some of the, even some of the corn soybean sites. When we, when we dropped by 30, bush, 30 pounds to the acre, we saw that uh, farmers suffered uh, almost to the tune of, of five bushels to the acre here. I don't know if suffering is the right word, that might be a little strong, but it definitely uh, was something they probably noticed on their yield monitor. So there is something to be said for, for a study like this where we're start, starting to help farmers try to answer the question. Does MRTN work? Is it going to be a good decision on your farm? Should you have confidence in that as a recommendation system? And, and based on what I'm seeing here, you know, I think, I think the answer is yes. I mean, you're gonna have to make your own conclusions, but, but it does seem like there is a little bit of a steeper decline in yields as farmers reduce their nitrogen rate below MRTN, but not so much of an upside when they started pouring on nitrogen beyond the MRTN. And so, I'm not sure in today's market that, that, that it really actually pays for itself for that three bushels that they might get at $5.70 corn and the cost of nitrogen being 90 cents, maybe as much as a dollar a pound these days, depending on where you're buying it. It could, not, it could be one of those things that farmers may need to really consider uh, backing off their nitrogen rates just because of the economics alone. Uh, this data would, would support that, I think, and so would some of our data in 2019. But we need to keep moving here or I'll run out of time. So the other thing I did with the trial was look at MRTN as a rate of uh, partial factor productivity. So this is a term that I see used uh, a lot of times at universities, and IP and I used it a lot in the day. But it's looking at the total application of nitrogen divided by the yield that they achieved in bushels and how many pounds of nitrogen does it take to grow a bushel of corn? Not counting for the nitrogen that's in the organic matter pool uh, from the soil. We came up with roughly 0.8 pounds of nitrogen in the MRTN rate. With that going down to about 0.7 pounds of nitrogen per bushel when we backed off 30 pounds and up just a little bit when we added 30 pounds to 0.9 pounds. So if you're a farmer and you're thinking, okay, here's what I grew on my farm last year or in this field, if you multiply it by this number, is it getting you into the neighborhood of what you applied for nitrogen? If you're higher than that, you might be over applying. Um, so there's at least one way that we can take some of this on-farm data and start to come up with some rules of measure or ideas on how farmers might be able to get more efficient because these are no longer the 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per bushel of corn that we heard about in the 1980s and 90s. We well, we're well past that. We're well more, you know, much more efficient than that today. So you might ask yourself, where's that nitrogen? What's the fate of it? Where did it end up at? So I went out and measured at two foot depths in these trials after harvest in 2018. And if you remember, it was starting to get wet already because we were heading into that really wet year. So some of these were not easy to take but I did my best. And what I found was that, you know, we ranged from somewhere around 18 to 20 pounds of nitrogen on the low side in the top two feet, all the way up to about 60 pounds of, of nitrogen. And that's nitrate nitrogen in the top two feet of soil. So there's a big range, but it's not in the same field. It looks like it's field specific. So if you look at this data across 10 of the 40 sites, there's something that's unique. It's probably organic matter. It might be 
uh, something else in the mix, such as a, 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 an application of manure perhaps in the past, but it's, it doesn't seem like we're seeing that trend from the minus 30 to the MRTN to the plus 30, where you're really able to draw any kind of conclusion from this data that we were leaving behind nitrogen by over applying uh, above the MRTN. So I'm just not sure, you know, more work probably needs to be done. This is not a, a robust database with just 10 sites, but I think that's one of the things that we need to, to ask ourselves is, is if we're going to allow farmers to apply nitrogen rates at or above MRTN, and there's going to be regulation that may prevent that from happening, can farmers, if they do their own soil testing or have a third party do that, measure this at the end of the season? And if it's not able to be detected in the top two feet, is that acceptable? Or do we have to measure to four feet or all the way to the water table? What is an acceptable compromise? Because it, to me, it looks like somewhere, somehow that nitrogen either ended up in the, in the corn plant or I can't measure it with the tools that I have as an agronomist today. So it opens some questions on what that needs to be if we're going to be looking at regulating what farmers can do. So shifting here to the, the 2020 AFREC trials, the AFREC program shifted to ask me to do trials that were focused on management zones. So instead of just doing these trials in random areas of the field, we wanted to pick out areas that were low, medium and high performing areas. This is a, the management zone concept, right? Where we try to look at multiple years of our fields and figure out where we're having more success profit than others. And it does work in certain parts of the state and the country. So depending on where you are, this may be how you, you prescribe your, uh, your nitrogen program today. But AFRIC wanted me to do trials to look at whether we needed to revise or update fertilizer recommendations in those areas. So I used a commercial software program to come up with these management zones that were based on previous yield history. So they had, I believe, three to five years of yield history on these fields. The red areas that you see on the screen are going to be places that were underperforming, um, yellow were average, and then the green were the highest yielding areas of the field. So every field being unique, these are going to be in much different areas of the field. And I think a lot of times it's drainage related. Uh, so it's not that that's always going to be the case, but that does seem to be one of the underlying uh, reasons for why an area of the field has a tendency to be underperforming, at least in Minnesota. So in 2020, we had potassium trials. We also had sulfur trials, but we had primarily nitrogen trials to look at this approach by focusing in our trial into a management zone approach. There were 14 of these scattered around the uh, state of Minnesota, primarily you know, in, the, in the central part of the state. Um, and this is the chart that, that I wanna discuss for the next couple minutes here is, this is what we see across not just nitrogen, but also potassium and sulfur when we increase the fertilizer rates by that 30 pounds per acre. So uh, the green that you see on the screen are nitrogen trials. And the, brown, or the orange is going to be potassium, the yellow is sulfur. So what happened here is that we tried to put our trials in C zones. The C zone is that, that underperforming area, that area that farmers may not always be making money on, that may have issues with drainage or problems with eroded knolls. They're just places that are bringing farmers down and they're losing money in most of the years that they farm that. So when we, did, when we put these trials to work in those parts of the field that we poured extra nitrogen in those areas and you can see that we picked up eight, 10, sometimes as high as 20 bushels to the acre by adding additional 30 pounds. And remember 2020 wasn't overly wet. It wasn't overly dry. It was kind of that Goldilocks year between two interesting years that, were, uh, that we have research data for, but there really wasn't a reason to think that in 2020, there was a reason to have lost a lot of that nitrogen. So the, that additional nitrogen that may have gone into a poorly drained area probably was available for the plant uh, to take up. Uh, maybe less so for other nutrients, potassium and sulfur, we just didn't see that. And we also did some trials in high performing areas, those A zones with, with some of those nutrients. We're just trying to see is there money, is money well spent in those areas or can farmers maybe skip the application of sulfur or you know, pair back the application of potassium in really high performing areas of their field. So we, there's some suggestion, you know, the data isn't as robust because we don't have 40 sites like we did in 2018, it's a smaller data set, but there's a little bit of a trend here, I think. 
So if we switch that around and look at what happens if we back off 30 pounds to the acre, you can see that that that, that swing that pendulum swings back the other way. So those those same nitrogen uh, trials have uh, in, in the majority of cases starting to suffer some yield loss. So we go back below MRTN with our nitrogen rate application, and we're seeing anywhere between you know two and, and 30 bushels to the acre of yield reduction in those underperforming areas of fields. And again, that makes sense to me intuitively because if it's poorly drained, it still might be poorly drained even in an average year. You know, there's, there's a whole reason for putting tile in and trying to manage that extra water that's below your, 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 your field to, so that you keep that at field capacity and not saturated. So the data does suggest that when we back off fertilizer rates uh, that we did uh, see a, a yield reduction. And so these are a little bit different, but only by about a bushel from the 2018 data set. So remember in 2018, I was trying to put these trials into perfect areas, the Goldilocks zone of the field where I didn't think I was going to lose it in 2020. They went into the worst areas of the fields in a lot of cases. And I was just fortunate that we didn't lose them because I think in an average year, they would have been drowned out or, uh, or not, been, uh, not been harvested. But we still see within a, a bushel or two that we're working in that plus and minus three, four range as we deal with plus and minus 30 pounds of nitrogen. So that's what I've been seeing in the data. And we're up to now about 122 sites. So 2017 and 2018, we had those 48 sites. 2019, we had 29 sites. 2020, there were 25. And then we're starting to just kind of taper down the project. You know, every project has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So we're starting to try, try and wind this project up because we have so much data analyzed that we don't need to do it you know, for a long, long period of time. The other thing is that farmers do generally get fatigued. I think you got about two years to do a trial with an on-farm, uh, with a grower before they start to decide to move on and want to do something else. There's a hundred problems they need to solve on their farm. This is just one of a hundred problems they're trying to, to, to manage. So you're going to have to get in there, uh, work with them for a couple of years, either prove or disprove, answer that question, and then move on. So that's one of the things we'll, we're challenged with in doing on-farm trials is how we get farmers onboarded, how we get two years of trials, and then how we make sure that they got a good experience so that they can move on and do something else. The cost per trial is stable about $4,000. So about a third of that or a little bit more goes to the people doing the research. About a third of it, a little bit more goes to the grower and his advisor. And the rest is for uh, administrative costs, for supplies, for lab fees and for travel. That's what it costs. So remember if that $1,500 is what we paid to the grower, there's an additional $2,500 overall that goes into the, the cost of, of building out the, and doing the analysis of the on-farm trial. But you know, if you multiply 122 times 4,000, you're a little bit less than half a million dollars. So for 122, trial, 122 trials, half a million dollars in today's you know, market isn't that bad, I don't think. You have to look at what it costs to do you know, trials with universities and with contract researchers. But to me, that seems like that's a reasonable number. And so to kind of wrap up here, uh, I want to go back to those questions that I started, uh, that I posed at the beginning. Can farmers conduct high quality replicated nitrogen trials using precision ag technology? My answer is yes. I think they're going to need an advisor or an agronomist or somebody in that, in that uh, trusted advisor role to help them with that. Uh, I think there's going to be some farmers that could do this on their own, but I think the majority of the growers are going to need a little bit of help and nudge to get that done. Uh, to make sure that the data is collected and sent to the right parties. And they're going to appreciate that too, because their time is worth a lot in season. Second question was, what are the opportunities and challenges for advisors and farmers and retailers in this program? My answer to that question is we need to develop a large public database of, of on-farm trials. As I said before, I think a lot of retailers around the state will tell you that they have on-farm trial databases, but I don't think that data ever escapes the county. And it certainly doesn't go into the public domain because the growers haven't given permission for that to be used. The on-farm research that we did through AFRIC is data that we have in the public domain that we can use. So I think that's a difference. So I think you have to think about, you know, when you're investing in on-farm trials, who's going to benefit from that? Because I think it needs to now expand beyond just the county, beyond just the territory of the dealership and go to impact everybody in the whole state. So I think that's a challenge to, to people who are doing trials is making sure that the data 
the, the grower, first of all, signs off on that data so that we can use that. And we go through pretty serious processes of making sure that the grower's name and all that identity is removed from these AFRIC on-farm trials. But that's something that you also have to think about too, because spatial data inherently gives away location. And when you give away location, you might tell something about a farmer that they didn't want to, to have out in the public domain. So generally we don't give out the spatial data. We give out just the, the tabular data, the plot level data, but nothing to do with the shape files or the analysis go out in the public domain. And all the stuff that you saw this morning is in the public domain. It is available on the AFRIC website, which the website is listed there. If you want, you can uh, go out and download a copy of the, the report. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me if you have questions. Uh, and at that point, I think I'll stop and now take uh, questions. Bruce, how much time do I have for questions? Five minutes, okay. So the first question I see here is how did these retailers slash grower take the maps when the application was off? Right, so, so you know, the bearer of bad news is, is it's not always great, right? So I think you have to approach that not with a heavy hand. I think you have to come to the table with suggestions or ideas, but not to point fingers because a lot of times these people are doing the best they can, right? I have to acknowledge that they're trying uh, and they may not know this happened, but I think that would be the case is that most of the time this is an awareness thing. So we're also elevating the knowledge of, of growers because I don't think a lot of people honestly look at the as applied map. I think uh, it goes into a file folder and um, it disappears unless somebody has questions about an application. So I think even some situations that file gets deleted. Some of these machines just don't have hard drive space, Raven Viper, Pros and others I think of where they will just erase those machines before they reset them for the next season. So I think this is one of those things that we need to get better at as an industry as a whole is asking for that as a Biden map. Second question is management zone delineation has its own inherent accuracy limitations. How were management zones developed? So the management zones were developed using a proprietary process that a commercial company offered as a service. It was based on, uh, on the, uh, the yield data. So basically how this works is that if you look at multiple years of yield data across corn and soybean crops, you're looking at areas that are above average. Above average can be anything that's above the field mean average. And you look at, at those on cell by cell basis. So you're gonna break that field down into 10, 20, 30 meter squares. You're gonna look at that repeatability. So I think that that's, that's most of how these processes work. It requires that you have the history, the, the previous yield data of that grower. And I think that's where a lot of the value is, is who has amassed the most yield data that they can go back and, and, and do that. So there are limitations there. I think there are other ways of doing it. Satellite imagery is another one. You can look at NDVI values. Uh, you can look at soil type. You can look at anything. But I think you just need to be transparent in that process so that it's not a black box solution. You showed 25 to 28 bushel yield de decrease with fall instead of spring application, regardless of end rate. Interested to know what the farmer is doing now. So I think one of the outcomes of on-farm trial research is that a lot of times the farmers are, are happy with the results you know, they figure this is what they expect, but sometimes, and I won't call these farmers bad actors, but sometimes if you find somebody who may be genuinely applying a rate higher than they should be, uh, they look at that data and they might not do another trial because what has happened? You have generated some public data now uh, that shows that they didn't need to apply the, the rate that they are applying on their farm. So we have had a few growers who have opted out after the first year of the program because I think they realize that there's probably a, a risk. And so that is something we have to be careful about is that we don't want to make a case of anybody who is doing any practice that's bad, but that's where that trusted advisor role is so important because that is a shield between the grower and uh, you know, the MDA or the university is that, is that there's a trust level that I have in making sure that I protect and try to influence the grower to make that right decision so that that they don't feel like they should be scared of a program like this because it's not about that. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to force a farmer to change their nitrogen rate. Uh, the, the last question is, do you approach landowners or do the consultants bring this idea to the on-farm trials to them? So what I do is I develop a two-page protocol, uh, something that can be printed off or emailed to a grower. 
I give that to the consultant and then that consultant then goes out and, and this time of year, right? It's still the right time between now and about the first of April, farmers are willing to, to do these kinds of programs. So this is prime time to be asking your grower to do a nitrogen trial. It gives them all the details, what they need to do, the roles, the responsibilities, the timelines, the payments, all of that is paid for, or excuse me, all that is structured in that two page protocol document. Was there a question in the room? Go ahead, Brad. Not in the data that you saw here today, but it is, we do have all of that information in the database. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. So the question is, uh, did, did I mask out uh, any of the, uh, the bad actors as far as putting on things that weren't part of the BMP? So the nitrogen BMPs in Minnesota suggest that we don't apply urea in the fall anywhere in the state, if I'm, unless I'm wrong, and, and hydrous ammonia in just so, certain select areas. So I do have that in the database. We do have the form of nitrogen, that was used and the timing. So we would be able to answer that question and be able to pull that out. And I do think, uh, Brad, to your point, is that there was at least one urea trial that was done in the fall when that, we all know that's a no-no. And so that is flagged in there. And I believe that, they, that we may have actually gotten that particular advisor to have that serious conversation with their grower about that because the results were just so poor. And that's probably a win, you know, shifting growers away from from doing those bad practices but i think we have to do trials for at least two years on a farm to actually demonstrate multiple year over year impacts it's not just about doing trials for one year 